At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Stephen Hernandez. Stephen Hernandez is the Chief Information Security Officer for the United States Department of Education and the co-chair of the Federal Cisco Council. Stephen has a broad portfolio of, of experience spanning multiple industries and dimensions of cybersecurity and privacy. With past cybersecurity risk management experience in international heavy manufacturing, finance, banking, federal law enforcement, healthcare, and education, Stephen is sought after for his progressive vision for managing cybersecurity risk in this ever-evolving threat space. As an honorary professor at California State University at San Bernardino and affiliate faculty at the National Information Assurance and Training Center, Stephen knows firsthand the challenges facing cybersecurity in the educational sector. He is the winner of the Fed 100, Fed 50, ISC2 President's Award and the ACT IAC Government Contributor of the Year Awards. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephen Hernandez. Thank you so much for that, that glowing introduction, Justin. Uh, and it's an absolute honor uh, to be part of this, this data summit. Uh, this is frankly one of my favorite parts of my job is uh, being able to go out and interact with folks at the state, local, tribal, regional type of government levels and education levels um, to share one what's happening in our space and talk about what we're seeing across the board but two also to get a feel for what's happening in your space as well so much innovation and so much creativity happens at the grassroots level and the operational level of uh, educational institutions across the country that um, having these type of engagements is uh, it's it's really one of the creme de creme moments of my career um, and I'd also like to uh, thank you. Um, it's a, a, an absolute privilege to be here this morning uh, speaking to this group. Uh, we rarely get the time uh, to have just a sit down moment um, to engage around cybersecurity and privacy uh, with so many people hearing the same message and, and the same focus for, for even a brief moment. So thank you for taking the time this morning. Um, I know today's your, your closeout day, so uh, we're gonna kick off strong, finish strong. And uh, I'm going to get the slides pulled up. So while I'm doing that, a little housekeeping. Um, I've got a formal presentation that I'm going to provide. And if we have questions along the way, uh, what I'll ask is that we uh, leverage the technology we've got and get those questions um, into the, uh, the system. And then towards the end, I'll see if I can reserve about 10 or 15 minutes and uh, go through the, the questions as I'm able. So let's get started. Um, introduction taken care of. Let's, uh, we're we're going to dive right into the threatscape. What are we seeing out there in terms of attackers? And, and what are they going after? What's their modus operandi? What are the tools, the techniques, and tactics they're using? And as practitioners in the space around IT and especially the, 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 the data mission, because frankly, that's what, this, that's what drives all of this is the data and the information. What are we seeing? Um, we'll get into some best practices. What are we seeing in terms of capabilities that work? How has COVID as a pandemic shaped how we're approaching these uh, best practices? And then going right into on the federal side, uh, what are resources out there that you may wanna consider leveraging? Um, in many cases at uh, the state local level, you do have access to many capabilities, services, contracts that provide equitable strength, kind of the, you know, we always joke about the military grade, equitable strength to the similar type of capabilities we have at the federal level. And um, I, I want to make sure that folks are aware that these capabilities are out there where you may want to intersect uh, and use those. And in many cases, these resources are available at little to no cost. Um, also very important uh, given some of the budget realities we're all facing today. Uh, and then as I alluded to earlier, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Uh, jumping right in, uh, I, uh, Justin's introduction covered my past. Um, the US Department of Education uh, has been a wonderful position. And it's interesting that some people ask me the, my, my position before this, I was over at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in their Office of the Inspector General, and that's a law enforcement organization, oversight and governance, um, and they oversee about a trillion dollars in um, portfolio over at HHS. They said, 
why did you leave a mission like that and go to a mission like the Department of Education? And I said, well, it's, it's two reasons. Um, one, most people know the Department of Education for one of its primary missions, which is talking about educational opportunity and making sure that regardless of what zip code you're born into, what your financial situation may be at a given time, what your mental health, physical health situation may be, that you have an opportunity to get an education should you so desire. And, and that in and of itself is an incredibly powerful mission statement because as we all know, education is one of those things. It's, it's an indelible improvement on one's life that frankly, once you've got it, nobody can take it away. The second part of the department, though, um, which some folks don't always put the dots together, but when they do, they have that big aha moment, is uh, we're a bank, and we've got about a $1.6 trillion accounts receivable. And to put that into context, that is our federal student loan portfolio. And if we were compared across the globe based on accounts receivable as a bank, uh, we'd easily be in the top 10 most days within the top five, depending on how markets fluctuate uh, in the United States, easily within the top three. And so we have a tremendous mission to not only protect that educational opportunity mission space, but also manage the finances that go around education. Uh, we also broker between about another 800 billion and trillion dollars in grants and other funding. Uh, we have lots of grants and funding that are coming out as part of many of the COVID relief bills, for example. So uh, when we talk about you know, the size and the complexity of the mission, uh, the US Department of Education uh, is unparalleled in many ways when we factor in all of its mission space. And that's why I'm here. Uh, I'm here to protect that mission space. And uh, engagements like this are incredibly wonderful because they allow me to get out and talk about how we view the world, how we're doing the work we're doing, and hopefully get some engagement some back and forth in the Q&A uh, about what you're seeing as well. So let's dive right in about and, and talk a little about the current operational situation we're in. Uh, COVID obviously has, has turned things upside down and inside out in many ways, um, especially in the educational space. Uh, you'll see that something uh, that we've been doing is really focusing on awareness. Um, the threat actors are moving incredibly fast in this space. We'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. And uh, this is an example of one of the notices that we sent out in our own organization and kind of setting the tone early. This was almost a year ago that we sent out this alert, talking about what we were seeing in the threat space. If you're not doing something like this today um, within your program, within your group, start thinking about it. Um, you know, there's that old adage, if you, if you tell somebody something eight times, typically there's a pretty good retention. Uh, especially around the seventh or the eighth time, we, we take that to heart. Um, we send out reminders from an awareness campaign perspective, um, sometimes weekly, if threat activity is really high, uh, sometimes monthly, and if things are in a lull, even sometimes quarterly. Uh, but we always make sure that it's, it's relevant and uh, we're, we're, we're not afraid to shy away from pointing out we're seeing threat actors target specific platforms and what we call watering hole attacks. We'll talk a little bit about more what that looks like going into the future. Um, but something that's been interesting about our threat actors is how they've evolved. So um, in the beginning of COVID, it was fascinating because writ large across the, the federal space, uh, and across the education sector, we actually saw a small decrease in the, the threat actor activity. They, they actually lessened up on the attacks. And, and through some anecdotal evidence and some, some research we did uh, at the department, we discovered that it, it was really two things. Um, one, they had many of the same challenges we did. How do they, how do they retool and realign their campaigns? Because that's what they call them. Yeah, it's like a business model. We have a, a malware campaign, an advertising campaign. They, they use very similar terminology to what we see in, in well-run businesses. Um, how do we evolve our campaigns to fully maximize our exploitation profitability uh, going forward in this new teleworking and remote environment? And so they, they took a strategic pause and that, that did dampen down some of the attacks. And also they recognized that, especially on the ransomware front and some of these other fronts that 
uh, folks just didn't have the money to pay ransoms at that time. Uh, everyone was adjusting their budgets, taxes and revenue were, were all askew because of businesses being uh, shut down due to COVID and, and operational needs shifting from, uh, you know, today I was buying X, but now I needed to, to buy personal protective equipment or whatever the case may be. Uh, and so between the two, the financial driver and uh, the, the realignment driver, they took a brief pause. That didn't last very long. That lasted all of a few months. Uh, and then they, they figured out their new method. They figured out that uh, most organizations um, figure have gotten their finances sorted and, and kind of realigned with COVID and, and they dove right back in. Uh, and in fact, today uh, we have seen, uh, I would say a 500% increase in the amount of attacker activity uh, globally, just across the board. Um, I think these folks are also bored sitting at home, uh, socially isolating, and so uh, they've gotten very creative. And all you need to do is, is look in the news to see that um, what we charitably call the researchers, folks who find the vulnerabilities in systems, uh, they have been working overtime. Uh, when you look at Microsoft Patch Tuesday, et cetera, just heap after heap of new vulnerabilities, many of them critical. Um, and so very important that we're monitoring not only the threat environment, but also making sure on the other side, we're keeping up to date on patches in our systems. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, some of the behavior we've seen from threat actors through COVID and, and how that's shifted. So uh, this is a, an alert, uh, 20-099A because we're government and of course we have to make everything fairly convoluted and weird with jargon and acronyms. Um, but this was a really cool alert. Uh, this came out early into the, to the COVID pandemic, and it was actually a joint alert from the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and the United Kingdom's National Cybersecurity Center. And basically, this was one of the first joint products that came out that formally recognized a lot of this threat activity that was happening, but also recognized that COVID was a main driver for the messaging around the attacks, especially spear phishing and whaling uh, and just phishing in general. And this has evolved over time uh, as well. And what we've seen is that um, the advanced persistent threat groups, that's APT, basically, uh, typically, these are well-resourced nation-state type of attackers, and then we have our standard cyber criminals as well, which, frankly, they're becoming well-resourced as well. Um, what we're seeing is that, one, we have phishing, always have phishing. That's still the primary attack vector that we, we need to make sure we're protecting against. Uh, but we're seeing coronavirus and COVID-19 as a lure. We're seeing malware distribution using COVID-19 themed lures. Uh, we're seeing a lot of new domains being registered with the words COVID-19, etc. And then uh, lots of attack against infrastructure that was stood up out of haste. And so uh, many of us uh, responded as quickly and as rationally as we could to the environment, standing up services, lots of cloud deployment. Um, and unfortunately, what happened is not all of us had the time to go back and make sure we stood it up securely. Um, and our attackers know this, and they are taking full advantage of it. Um, and the exchange uh, vulnerability that was just in the news a while back, folks had on average of two to three days uh, to get those systems patched. And if they didn't, uh, at this point in time, if it's public facing, you can just assume compromise. Uh, if it's internal, you're probably got a 30% chance you're compromised as well. So um, if, you're, if you're looking at that situation and you say, yeah, we did stand up a lot of stuff. Um, if you haven't gone back and checked it lately, probably a good time to do so. And the social engineering aspect of some of these attacks uh, has evolved greatly over, over this time period as well. For example, one of the things that we've noticed is traditionally we would see email as the primary carrier for a malicious link, a malicious attachment, et cetera. Um, but we've also seen uh, fake applications that have been developed. Hey, we're, uh, we're from the, the, the city of Washington, DC. This is our COVID tracking app. Why don't you download and install it? And you know, particularly for Android, they'd say, oh, it's not on the app store. You need to sideload it from this vendor over here. 
Uh, and then of course it, it basically downloads a complete root kit onto the phone and they're now in the middle of all your communications, including your passwords and usernames. Um, COVID lock uh, was the big one for that. Um, and then we have uh, other files, standard email malware uh, that continues to play out. Now, they're really pushing this idea of authenticity and frankly, authority. And so they're leveraging organizations like the World Health Organization, um, putting doctor in front of the titles, uh, because most people don't know, you know who these people are, or, but it, it sounds important. And so as part of our training, we need to make sure that folks aren't instinctively reacting to appeals to authority. Just because an email says it's from a doctor and it's from the who, um, it's okay to take a moment, pause, and think about, wait a minute, is why, uh, why am I receiving this? And I am actually going to check this out and actually maybe do some out-of-band communication. Um, and what's interesting is how the, the lures evolved. So it started with a lot of financial lures. COVID-19 and basically we looked at payday protection type scams. We looked at uh, a lot of scams or a lot of malicious emails that focused on uh, per uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. Uh, because especially in the beginning of the pandemic, that's what everyone was very concerned about. How can I make sure I'm protecting my, my staff, my employees, my loved ones? How can I make sure that I have the right protective equipment uh, available? And so the attackers were like, great, that's what they want. That's what we'll do. We then saw that we saw that evolve over to uh, more so uh, what we see today, which is all around the vaccine. And hey, guess what? You're, you're, you're on the list, we can, we can get you in. Just go to this website, give us all this information and uh, you know, we'll, we'll get you the, the vaccine sooner than later. So our attackers are, are aggressively monitoring the, the actual operational environment, figuring out what is in demand at the moment and then tailoring their attacks to align with what they see out in the, the operational space. So for us, as we're thinking about how do we keep our people aware, how do we keep our people safe? One of the things we need to do is stay in tune. Basically, if you're thinking about, oh, I can't wait till I get my vaccine, that is probably a primary driver that some of our attackers are going to use. Um, the other thing that we've saw is multi-channel attacks. And so normally when we see malware and we see ransomware, uh, it, it's almost always associated with email and, and email being the primary driver. Uh, during COVID though, because people are working remote, we've seen a vast array of other channels used. This is an example of uh, SMS message that actually contains a, uh, a link that would deploy malware uh, had it been clicked. And you'll see exactly uh, what I was alluding to before. Uh, appeal to authority, UK government. Appeal to action, urgent, drawing on the emotional base. You're probably already frazzled, sleep deprived, figuring out you know, how, am I, how am I handling the kids and holding down a job at the same time. Um, and then, you know, oh, money, money, money's good. I, I can use that as well. Uh, and then COVID-19 square in there, tap here, just, just click. Um, we, we, we make it easy. And so uh, a very, very short message, very concise, but very powerful in what it's trying to do uh, to draw folks into uh, making a, a poor decision. Uh, if you took that link, it would take you to this page and uh, they, would for, they would start data collection. So they'd say, oh, give me your postcode. Okay, what's your address? Great, okay, now, uh, hey, I need some banking information so I can uh, make sure you get that 485 pounds in your account. And so the, here again, they gradually walk people into giving them information through a series of escalating sensitivity. So start with a zip code. Well, everybody knows my zip code, don't care, okay. Let's get your home address now. Oh, put that in. Oh, okay, fine. And then, you know, maybe first name, last name. Oh, okay. Banking information. Ooh. But if I asked for banking information on the first one, most people would probably say, eh, hang on. That's, uh, that's, a, little, uh, that's a little forward. 
but walking people through a progressive escalation, kind of boiling the frog, uh, to use the term, um, they, they lure people in and they lull people into a sense of security. Um, and they're, they're very good at this. Uh, like I said, masters, that masters of marketing, if you think about it, uh, because they use what we call dark trace or dark path uh, type of uh, design when they design these sites. Uh, the three big ones, uh, as I alluded to earlier, credential theft, um, especially now that we have a lot of disparate services. Um, something that happened when we deployed a lot of these technologies is we said, um, don't have time to necessarily integrate this with a single sign-on at the, at the organizational level. So we'll have separate credentials for everything. Um, that has led to a situation where our attackers recognize that, oh, now I have even more credentials I can grab. If I can grab one, that may lead me to potentially others. And so wherever possible, we recommend folks do integrate if they have a single sign-on solution and make sure that folks know this is how we access our services. Um, and then the, the other two are really around um, the malware deployment. And in some cases, this is end user machines. And so um, deploying, for example, key loggers on someone's personal equipment because they know that personal equipment is now being used for attacks. And, and this has expanded their attack view because now they're also interested not only in your official email accounts, my, for example, stephen.hernandez at ed.gov, they're also interested in my personal email accounts because they know that I'm likely to use those on my personal endpoint. And if they can compromise my personal endpoint, they know that many of us are using them for, for work and official purposes. One of the things that can happen is they'll deploy a keylogger there. And if you're only using username and password for your services, well, they got them. It's just that easy. And from a visibility perspective, it's really hard to see that because oftentimes uh, we don't have the same visibility into uh, the personal endpoints that we do the organization deployed endpoints. So something to think about when you're deploying these technologies as you're advancing the security around these technologies is making sure that one, take into account where these are being used. Oftentimes on personal devices, you may not have control over. And two, making sure that if you do have those situations, um, multi-factor is your friend. Because even if you can get my username and password through key logging on a personal device, what you cannot get is hopefully uh, the token generator on my phone through an app or even SMS. S SMS is not the strongest multi-factor, um, but it's a lot better than username and password. Uh, so if you're not using multi-factor as part of your deployment for your technologies, I highly recommend you consider figuring out how to get that in. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about how that fits into this idea of the new teleworking infrastructure and services, the rapid deployment of technologies. Hey, we needed something out. We configured it username and password. Now's the time we need to go back and figure out, okay, how do we take that to the next step and enable the multi-factor authentication as well? Uh, this is the NIST cybersecurity framework. And one of the things that's Im important uh, as part of this is, when we talk about attackers and we talk about how they operate, um, one of the ways we frame it is in time. And the way that the cybersecurity framework uh, looks at an attack is they say, well, you have detect right in the middle. And that's when the bad thing happens. That's when you detect the bad thing happening. And we always, you know, in, in very informal terms, we call that the boom. And then anything left of the boom in the identify and protect are things that if we do these things right, we should be able to make that boom smaller. And hopefully we can push that boom further to the right in terms of the timetable, or maybe even get rid of it completely. And so we have things like governance processes, we have risk assessments, we talk about data security, encryption, protection, all the good things that we can put in place to try to either stop the boom, make the boom smaller or delay it out further. We have detect, which is our ability to actually understand when we've had a breach or had a compromise. Um, and then we have the recovery and the, the respond activities that happen afterwards. Oh, there's the boom, respond. How well can we respond incident response um, and mitigate, get things back to normal? And then how do we recover? How do we get systems back to good? 
Uh, this is important when we think about our systems because um, this is often a resource discussion. Where do we need to put the resources? And this is shifting a little. So before um, a lot of the events of the past few months, especially looking at things like solar winds or the Microsoft Exchange situation, before the, the mantra was, you know, invest in cybersecurity up front. And if you do enough of that, you're going to have less need for everything that comes after it. The challenge we're seeing is though, you, you take something like solar winds, if you did everything right, you did everything left of boom right, you're like, nope, I only use signed updates from the vendor. I, I only, you know, I tested, I put it in a sandbox to make sure that it works, et cetera. If, even if you did all of that right, you still got compromised. You still had the malware load in because the adversary was as sophisticated and that advanced. That adversary, by the way, by some counts, has up to 5,000 developers working on malware. It's, it's just incredible what, what folks are throwing at us. So what does that mean for us in reality, though? What that means is that um, not only do we need to maintain those strong practices because um, while these are insular events, if we're not practicing good cyber hygiene, uh, it's just game over out of the gate. It's, it's just very simple to move forward. But what it does mean is that we need the ability to detect when things are abnormal. For example, if I have a solar wind server and I'm using it to monitor internal assets in my, in my data center or in my cloud, and all of a sudden that server starts beaconing out to the internet, one, do I have the ability to detect it? Two, do I have the ability to know that that's a problem? And then three, do I have the ability to actually do something about it quickly? Um, and if you're not at a point where you can say, yes, 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 um, that's something you need to start thinking about um, from an overarching governance perspective. And as we get a little further in this presentation, I'll talk about some of the technologies that are out there, uh, both from the Department of Homeland Security and through folks like uh, MSISAC uh, that can help in this space. Uh, and the watering hole attack reigns supreme uh, when we see the phishing and a lot of the attacks uh, coming our way right now. Um, for those who, who are not familiar with the, the phrase, it's exactly what it sounds like. And this, this picture, sum, picture sums it up nicely, right? Uh, the attacker in this case, our, our lion across the way there knows that at some point, all the animals need water. And so I'm gonna come and I'm gonna, basically set up shop here and wait for my dinner to come to me. Um, our attackers are no different. They know that we're heavily reliant on a lot of tele telecommunication uh, services, a lot of video conferencing services, a lot of file sharing, data sharing technologies at this time. And so what it means is that um, they will profile your organization. They will try to understand what technologies you have in play, and then they will attempt to mimic those technologies as part of their attacks. And so knowing what tools you use and having a good profile and understanding of those tools can also help you customize your awareness campaigns um, and also make sure that you're monitoring. Um, in, in some cases, you can monitor, for example, the DNS entries that are out on the open web if you're pretty sophisticated and say, hey, you know, was there a, was there a data summit domain registered that we didn't put out there? That's very odd. Um, and you can start to work that back into your own intelligence analysis. Uh, let's talk about teleconferencing. So as an overarching uh, guidance, especially, you know, for in my own organization, and as we look across the federal government, um, some of the best practices for teleconferencing. One, if you're an organizer, and, and kudos to the folks who set up this conference, I just want to give a shout out because I saw all of these uh, being practiced, so great work. Uh, one, if, especially if you're doing sensitive information, require a password for entry and, and use the lobby feature. Uh, if you can't identify people, don't let them in. Um, if you have exceptionally uh, sensitive meetings, you may even want to consider what we call a, a, a roll call password, uh, which would require folks to either come on video so you can visually identify them before the meeting starts, or uh, you actually send each of the attendees a, a passphrase via a known good channel either SMS or email where you know they'll get it. And then during roll call, they have to, okay, everybody, you know, sign in and provide your passphrase. 
passphrase doesn't match you, you, you throw them out. Um, if the solution you're using supports closing or locking your rooms, do it. Once the meeting starts, lock the door. You know, uh, I, I know I had the professors that did that. Once class started, close the door and sorry, <laughs> if you're not here on time, you're, you're gonna miss the session. Uh, so I do love the education uh, link with that one. Uh, and then make sure you thoroughly understand the capabilities of the tool. Understand how you can remove people if you don't know who they are. And then when you're sharing information, uh, always share in this order. Think of least privilege. Um, if you can share just the file, like I have here, I've, I've shared um, just the PowerPoint, do that. If you can share just the application, that's your next best option. And then finally, your, your desktop. Uh, reason being is, uh, in, in some uh, tools, if they're not configured correctly, it's very easy to click the button and say, hey, I wanna take control of the session. Um, and in, if uh, as a presenter, you've followed this hierarchy, it limits what people can get access to. Um, and it also eliminates uh, potential other information that may inadvertently be on your desktop. Um, obviously, if you're on webcam, um, it's always good to be aware of your background. Uh, if I didn't have my Department of Ed background, you'd see a big whiteboard behind me in my home office that has lots of network diagrams and other sensitive information about how we're setting up shop from an architecture perspective in my department. Um, and then also, uh, you, you know, just in general, you, you always want to be considerate of uh, what's happening with your guest lists and making sure, you know, for example, we're recording this session. There's a pop-up that comes up and lets folks know, but there's some other things. If you have a sensitive meeting, you just need to set the rules of the road out in the beginning and say, screenshots are not good or not okay, not approved in this particular meeting. Uh, here again, you, you can control the meeting platform, but in some cases you may not be able to control the device and the device may be able to take screenshots um, or record without your knowledge. Um, when you're attending, Something to think about is, are you using uh, a sanctioned or a uh, approved conferencing service provided by your organization? Um, or are you joining someone else's? And, uh, you know, a few things here. One, obviously, double, triple check the links um, based on the information I just provided. Make sure your client software is up to date on the endpoint. But then if you're joining someone else's meeting, you should just hold the assumption that, Everything you share could be potentially recorded, could potentially be made public. Um, and this is doubly, triply true if you're joining onto free or no cost solutions. Um, if you're invited to share information and you're not sure about the trustworthiness of the platform or it's not your platform, um, you know, offer to host it and say, hey, I would prefer we use our hosting solution or you know, maybe figure out, hey, could we talk about your platform and kind of how you're gonna configure it for this session um, so that they understand your expectations around security and making sure information stays where it belongs. So let's talk about a little bit about data rich environments. Uh, you, you all are here for a data summit. So um, I know data is at the heart and, and the soul of what you're doing. Um, and it, even now, as we're standing up these massive new services, the number one key is if you don't know what you have, you, you, you really can't protect it. And so understanding where your crown jewels are uh, still reigns supreme in making sure that we can enforce things like least privilege, uh, the identification, retention, et cetera. Something to think about, and, and this is on the planning side, is if you're in a very data rich environment, at some point, you, you have to assume that you're gonna have some type of breach, some type of loss. And the time to get in touch with all the people who can help you in those situations is not ideally the time when the breach is occurring. Um, we should have those conversations months, even years before the actual event occurs. Um, and what this means is that if you, if you don't have an incident response plan in place, um, it's probably time to get one going. And in particular, uh, it's not just the technology folks that need to be involved. In fact, during crisis management, the technology portion of these things is typically very straightforward. We, we contain, we mitigate, we get things back up and going. The real sticky wickets are things like, what does your external affairs look like? What does your relationship with the press look like? What does your legal counsel think needs to happen? What is your engagement with law enforcement? And if we haven't thought about these things before the event, 
uh, it makes the actual event when it occurs exceptionally messy and challenging. So something to think about. If you haven't put this type of thinking in place now, probably a good time to do it. Um, also, as we're evolving, I, I think uh, it's pretty clear that even after the pandemic, we're not necessarily going to go back to working the way we did before. Um, there's going to be a, a heavy reliance on hybrid work environments, um, a lot more telework uh, around the around the board, even even for environments that are traditionally very much in-person type of activities. Uh, I think the expectation is that we're still going to have a lot more telework than we did before. And so as we're going through and we're looking at our service providers, um, there's some things that we should be looking at as well. Um, whenever you can, especially if you need a rapid standup of services, always look at software as a service as your first choice. Um, and the reason why is because from a cloud perspective, software as a service means that the vendor is going to be responsible for about 90% of your security controls on average. Uh, and that's, that's a huge lift off of you. Now, the, the key is you do still need to make sure that they're configured correctly, especially if you need to go into the admin panel and, and set those things. Uh, but the good news is that they should be there out of the gate, ready to use. Uh, and if the vendor hasn't turned them on, hopefully you can turn them on. Data portability is also very important. Um, many cloud providers, especially on the infrastructure and platform side, it costs you zero to put data into their environment and it costs you an arm and a leg to pull it out of their environment. And that's the way they like it. Um, so always, always look at data portability because most of us deal with tremendous amounts of data and um, getting data moved around, especially as the workload or the mission necessitates it, the last thing we want is to be stuck based on financial uh, entrapment in some ways. Um, this is a fun one. So I mentioned leverage FedRAMP systems here. Uh, many states are also engaged in what's called state ramp. That's a, a new program uh, set up at the state level through a, a bunch of the state CIOs and security folks. Um, the reason I mentioned FedRAMP, and that's an acronym for the uh, Federal Risk Assessment Management Program for cloud, um, basically, when a cloud provider says, yes, I have a FedRAMP solution, in many cases, that is a physically separate instantiation of their cloud stood up for government customers. Um, and those environments are built uh, to federal security standards. Um, and in, in many cases, um, as a state, local, uh, tribal, regional um, type of organization, you can consume and you can get in that environment versus the commercial environment. Um, there's trade-offs. While uh, the government side typically has a, a little more stringent standards and requirements around security, the rate of innovation is also a little slower because as new technologies come out, you need to have more testing and more security testing for the government side of the equation. Um, but if you're interested in that, uh, talk to your provider. If you're interested in a service, say, hey, do you have a FedRAMP version of what you're offering and what does that look like? Uh, because if you can get that version, um, you can get a lot of security out of the gate uh, that meets federal requirements. And, uh, you know, the great news is it's already built. And um, there are some other great tools out there. Um, if, you know, for whatever reason, the service you're looking at doesn't necessarily meet FedRAMP, you know, another great question is, uh, do you meet like the Educause Higher Education Cloud Assessment Tool? Another great tool, lots of cloud vendors have voluntarily assessed themselves against this. Um, and it's really focused on more of an educational perspective and use case versus other industries. Some other resources I want you to be aware of is, of course, at the department, um, our, our two main drivers at intersections with a lot of the work uh, at the state level is at the, it's, it's at the privacy level, FERPA. Um, and we've got a, uh, a great um, FERPA and privacy page, the, the PTAC there, the second link. Uh, we also have the student privacy page at ed.gov. Lots of helpful tips about how do we make sure that we're protecting the data uh, about our students um, and making sure that uh, it's only being shared with those with authorization to do so. Um, our friends at the FBI, um, they're uh, an incredibly helpful resource, especially when an incident happens. And something I always advise folks is, um, one, um, if you see evidence of what appears to be an APT, advanced persistent threat, or you know potentially some really advanced uh, criminal activity or, or cyber attack, go ahead and report it. 
uh, the ic3.gov. It's, it's a great place uh, that you can submit that type of information um, and they will coordinate and correlate and figure out what's going on. Um, if you don't know, and if you haven't contacted your local FBI field office, this is one of those things where planning early pays off later. Um, the, the FBI has field offices across the nation, and especially when we have cyber attacks, um, they're often interested because they're often coordinated across the country. Uh, and then last, uh, the FBI has InfraGuard, which is a group that is focused on threat information sharing. Uh, most state, local, and regional uh, folks are uh, potentially eligible to join InfraGuard. Uh, and it's a great source to one, figure out who's in your local field offices and who those players are, uh, but two, also to, to get up-to-date threat information. What is the FBI seeing, in some cases regionally or locally, uh, that we might be of, of interest? Um, and uh, of note, uh, you know, if the FBI does get involved in an investigation that you have, their primary focus is on prosecution and bringing folks to justice who, who do these type of activities. Uh, and they've done a, a great job. Even when folks are overseas, uh, they will prosecute them and basically make it so that if they ever wanna set foot in a first world nation, uh, they'll, they'll be arrested and, and extradited to us. So it's very effective and uh, they, they need our help. They need the case materials so that they can move forward. Uh, where the FBI doesn't necessarily guarantee help, and I'll just be very transparent about this, is on like the incident response side of things and kind of the cleanup of things. That's, that's not really where they work. They often have information that's helpful in that space, uh, but they're more interested in bringing folks to justice who are, who are attacking uh, our nation and our educational sector. Um, if for whatever reason uh, you have a, a particular attack and it's related to financial, so you know somebody's trying to defraud your organization, um, uh, you, you, you see some money moving through and it's it's not it's not kosher, it's it's not good. Uh, the Secret Service uh, can also be involved in those areas and uh, another group where it's just good to know who 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 the folks are in your regional office, especially if you're at the operational level of your organization uh, for cybersecurity. Okay, heard something, but I, I think we got it. Um, 15 minutes to go. Got it. I got about five more minutes of material and we'll get to Q&A. Appreciate the time check. Um, a few other items. Uh, we've got the Department of Justice best practices. So here again, setting up yourself for success in the event that uh, you do have a cyber incident. This is an excellent resource. The NSA top 10 cybersecurity mitigation strategies. I get this a lot, Stephen. We're a small shop, we can't do it all. What should we focus on? The NSA's top 10 is a, is a fantastic place to look and say, you know, if you can only work on one thing, start with the top 10, start with number one and, and see how far you can take it. Um, I mentioned the FedRAMP program. Uh, they have a lot of really good free training around cloud security. Uh, that link is there. And then I mentioned the DHS, the Cybersecurity um, Infrastructure and Security Agency. Uh, they offer a lot of no-cost services uh, to state, local, tribal, regional partners, including vulnerability scanning. So if you have publicly facing assets, they will scan it uh, and provide you reports. And they will tell you, if I were an attacker looking at your organization, this is what I would see. And these are the vulnerabilities we see that you may want to take care of. They will also do a phishing campaign for you. Um, and they will measure your, your organization's ability to identify and appropriately respond to phishing attacks. Moving on to uh, the MSISAC, which is the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, I mentioned that you, know, you can get services that are on par with what we use in the federal government. And what you'll see here is that through MSISAC, there's plenty of free for all resources um, and I won't go through all of them, but lots of secure configuration guidelines, lots of different security controls, um, a little bit of an assessment tool down there, and even a, a risk assessment method if you're thinking about how do I approach it in my environment. But the big ones I want to point out is remember that detect conversation. Um, well, well, how can I do that? Uh, you'll see that over here um, you have this Albert network monitoring. We have in the federal government what we call Einstein. So, you know, cute play on words, but it's effectively saying that we're going to monitor traffic coming in and out 
of your organization. And when we detect anomalous behavior, we're going to alert you. That one does have um, a small fee associated with it. There's some network engineering that has to take place, but uh, really good capabilities there, especially combined uh, with the MSISAC uh, membership. Um, and that gets you that 24 seven kind of SOC capability that goes arm in arm with Albert. So all wonderful services that if you're, if you're not using right now, something you could consider if it's the right fit for you, um, it's great technology that's out there. With that, I am right at time. So um, feel free uh, to reach out to me. Um, email by far the best way to get a hold of me. 